But Lord, we come before you humbly here this morning. We are here to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, Lord, because that is what you desire us, the true worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. So we praise you in this place this morning, Lord, and we give you glory and honor because you are the one true God. And Lord, we, we declare that your majesty reigns forever and ever, Lord, because you are the king above kings and the Lord above all lords, Lord. So we worship you in this place. Lord, we surrender our hearts to you this morning. We turn our hearts to you and we turn our face to you, God, that we can look at you unveiled like Moses had the veil on his face, Lord. And we think that we can come before you boldly before the throne of grace with unveiled faces, Lord, that we can stand here in your glory, Lord. So we pray that the weight of your glory would fall on this place, Lord, that it would come and set us free because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So we praise you in this place this morning, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Keep us down and join us.
Jesus, God, we praise you in this place this morning. our prayer, Lord, that your kingdom come, your will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven, God. Lord, we surrender it all to you, Lord, because the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever are yours, God. So we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray, Lord. Father, let your kingdom come, because it's all yours. So we surrender it all, we praise you in this place this morning. 
want to sing that bridge one more time. It's yours and all yours. And it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The river and never. yours, all yours, all yours, the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever, the kingdom is God, it's yours. So we surrender ourselves to you this morning, God. We bow down our hearts to our King. And we worship you, Lord. For you are the good God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, Lord. Thank you for being a good dad, Lord.
surrender to your embrace and there's nothing more than you and I see your perfection I'm lost in your peace and your faithfulness it sings over me and your love is the light of my Listen to all the things the Lord is saying. We really are in this very awkward place between point A and point B. And and God will often tell you point A. He'll tell you what it is. Or you're living in it. You know. And he'll tell you what point B is. But he doesn't tell you a whole lot about between A and B. And that's usually where things get complicated. Uh, and that, I feel like, is where we are at today. I, I I want to encourage you with the words the Lord has given us as a church. And I want you to know that when God speaks, he speaks individually to churches. Each church has their own direction, right? The direction that God has given us largely surrounds getting out of debt and uh, staying with the boat. I mean, those are two really strong words he's given us. And yet as I look around... I wonder how many still remember the whole staying with the boat thing. I'm not being mean, right? I'm just, I'm not being mean. But people have left. People have walked away. And 
And it's not that this is the ultimate boat. I can just tell you that God is going to take us through. I know he's going to. I can't speak for those who are outside the boat. And it's not my job to speak for them. I, I just want to encourage you, reach out to those around you who are straying and wandering and drifting out. Um, the waters that we have found ourselves in are not navigatable by men. They just aren't. I can't, I can't tell you the number of people that call me and email me and, and say, what, what kind of, what kind of this do I buy? What kind of that do I buy? And it's clear everybody's prepping for disaster. Everybody is. We're buying food. We're buying generators. We're buying, we're buying everything we can buy. And that's fine. I'm not, I'm not upset about that. And yet I can just tell you, we don't have any word about that. As a church, God has given me no word about that. Now, I'd be willing to bet that God had been speaking to folks on the East Coast. Y'all need to have some sort of plan in place. That would just be my bet. I don't know a lot of pastors on the East Coast, so it's hard for me to say. In the midst of what he has told us, just keep in mind there's nothing wrong with you doing lots of things. What's concerning me is people are, are burying themselves in debt to buy stuff God never told them to buy. When he did say, get out of debt. So I'm not, just please hear me this morning. I'm, I'm, I am, I'm trying to help you understand there, it is the same storm, but many boats, right? We're all in different boats. We are going to experience different things than they're going to experience on the East Coast. And, and different parts of the country are going to experience different things. We just need to trust the Lord and we need to stick together because he, that's how he's going to bring his protection. All right, all that is not even in my notes, so we're going to have to... Let's turn this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to read from verses 10 through 12. I apologize for the mic this morning. From time to time we hit... There, there's transmissions and they, they pick up and I should have changed the channel and I didn't, so... We'll just have to work through the popping noises. Also, let me remind you how you can give. There's a basket over here. There's there's electronic ways that you can give. Uh, you can give online. Uh, you can go to our website. Second Corinthians chapter nine verses ten through twelve. Now he, that's God. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. He will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, that means through the apostles, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In other words, what was happening is... People were being generous, they were giving the money to the apostles, and the apostles were then taking it out and distributing it as people had need. This service you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. I want you to know as, as the, the church here, uh, your generosity... The generosity of those in our church has been able to help people all over the world. And we continue to do that. That help has resulted in thanksgiving to God. People, people say, they send emails and they say thank you for what, what you have done. Right now, I, again, I don't know how much of this makes American news. There's massive flooding in India. Right, so like what's happening on our eastern seaboard, that's like happening all through India, only there's nobody to come and help. Right? They're just they just lose everything and they do their best. Um and so we're doing our best to help them. There has been severe flooding in Kathmandu. Like you can bring up the that's where Pastor Daniel is. The roads are just they're they're massive rivers. I just want you to know, because of your generosity, we've been able to send food and blankets and other things to help people through their need. But it's not just the need of people in other countries that you've been able to help. 
We've also helped families in our own town. We do this through things like the Good Samaritan Fund. We help people who can't quite get ends. They get them together. They just can't quite get them tied. We can't help everybody, but we help where we can. And we help our own family here, this family. And we do that through Acts 4. Um, Through Acts 4, we are carrying one another's burdens in our hearts. I think that's some pretty cool stuff. Father, I lift these people up before you. I lift this house up before you. Father, I pray that you would cause this house to be a house of prosperity in Jesus' name. Father, I believe that you've called us to prosperity. Not so we can spend it on our own indulgences, but so that we can be a blessing to those who are in need. So so we can give to many. Not, not just lend, but give to many. And borrow from none. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk in the footsteps of Christ as we do these things, as we work out your will, as we accomplish the things you've set before us. And Father, I pray that you would bless this people in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, you would arrest death that's still in their lives and that you would remove the burden from them. Father, I pray you would break it free from them. I pray, Father, that your grace and your mercy would go before them and your power and wisdom would go before them in Jesus' name. Amen. I've, I've had a few people, okay, I've had a lot of people, <laughs> few, relative number. Uh, they've heard me say that I believe we are heading into one of the greatest transfers of wealth in all of human history. And they say, but, but the way you talk, it doesn't sound like that. Well, you have to understand, the greatest transfer of wealth isn't for everybody. Sorry. It's for the faithful, Right? Do you remember when the master came back, he took the money from the unfaithful servant, the one talent, and he gave it to the servant with five talents, not even the servant with two, with five. Money destroys people a lot of times. God is not going to lose you over a couple of bucks. But for those who are faithful, for those who have shown themselves faithful, for those who have done what God has called them to do, and they've been faithful with the little, he's going to entrust them with much because the gospel has to be preached and that money has to flow through some path, right? It'll typically throw through, flow through the path of least resistance and through the path that won't get damaged in the process. I don't know how to say it clearer than that. You, you have in the coming months i don't I, it's my opinion i don't think we even have a year um as as systems begin to fail which is okay don't let that panic you right that's not negative right it's just it's a transitional time but money will move out of broken banks into strong banks money will move out of uh broken retirement companies into good retirement. You watched this in 2007, 2008, and nobody was going, well, that's weird. It's exactly what we expect to happen. And as money flows through all these different hands, as it moves out of one place into another, some people will lose a lot, and other people will become quite wealthy. This is exactly what happened at the end of 1929. The market crashed. Some people lost everything. They lost everything. It was so bad, some people were jumping out of windows because they just didn't know what else to do. It was that bad. But at that same point in history, some people, some people became incredibly wealthy, unbelievably wealthy, like like unbelievably wealthy. Just understand that that is the season that we're in. A change is coming, and and it's the it's same storm. Everybody's going to find themselves in different boats. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So I'm trying to encourage you to be faithful with the little because he is going to entrust, he's going to entrust you with some of his wealth. I think that's his intention and his plan. And that shouldn't frighten you. It shouldn't make you afraid. You shouldn't be afraid of the things that lie ahead. I would remind you of the word the Lord gave us. 
Not even the smell of smoke would be on us. Well, that does indicate we're going into a fire. You get that, right? That's what it indicates. It just means that we aren't subject to it. Yes? I feel like, I feel like I'm not always being clear. They bound the boys and they threw them into the furnace. You understand it was in that furnace their bonds were broken. They were des- the bonds were destroyed in the furnace, not their clothes. And one like a son of man appeared in their midst. Praise the Lord. All right, let's turn to Acts chapter 23, verse 11. I've really been pondering on this point A to point B stuff. If you got the newsletter this week, you you saw that. And by the way, if you want to be getting the newsletter and you're not, just let me know. And if you are getting it and you don't want to, just let me know that too. Acts chapter 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Now I want you to know that this passage comes at really a critical time in Paul's ministry. Maybe just a little bit of background. Uh, In Acts uh, 21, so we're a couple chapters ahead, if you go back a couple chapters, he was staying with with Philip the evangelist. He was at Philip's house, and, and this is the same Philip who had went out to the Ethiopian eunuch, right? You remember that that whole thing? So he's staying at Philip's house. And while he is there, a prophet named Agabus drops by for a visit and really doesn't have anything good to say. Agabus takes Paul's belt, ties it around his own hands and feet, and he prophesies over Paul. And he says this. He says, in this way... The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Acts 21, verse 11. Okay, now, you have to understand, God and Paul, they're fairly tight. They talk a lot. This is not news to Paul. Paul knew this was coming. He already knew he was going to Jerusalem. And by the Spirit, he knew he wasn't going there for a birthday party, right? He knew this was going to be fairly serious. And so when he gets his belt back, He tells everybody at the house, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm not only, I'm not ready only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 21, 13. What I want you to see is that Paul had made peace with whatever the outcome was. Right? He's already made peace with all of that. God had shown him some things. And he knows what's going to happen. Okay, now, the passage I opened with, Acts 23, this particular night, here he sits, and he is, in fact, bound over. He's in a barracks in Jerusalem, and he's waiting to be turned over to the Gentiles. This is exactly what had been prophesied about him. And he's living it out. Let's pray. Lord, help me today to encourage your people and to build them up and to strengthen them. Father, help me to share your life and your truth with them. In Jesus' name, amen. So often what happens in our lives, God will show us the destination he has planned for us. He'll he'll tell us. We'll we'll get words about property that's going to come and houses that are going to come, or, or spouses that will come. He'll tell us where we're going, but he very, very rarely offers any details about the journey. He just doesn't say much about it. On this particular night, as Paul waits in this barracks, he must have recognized the reality of what's going on. The word the word that he had received, that he would suffer in Jerusalem, that he would be bound over, it's fully come to pass. He doesn't have any more word. He's he's got, this has happened. He is just about 
probably in the morning going to be turned over to the Gentiles. Uh, again, he doesn't know what's going to happen at this point. He's we, we have the advantage of flipping the page. He didn't, right? So he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen, but as he waits for the morning, I think at least at some level, he was probably readying himself for death, right? This is the end of the words that I have. Uh, God told me I was going to go to Jerusalem. He's told me half a dozen times I'm going to be bound. But something happens to him this night as he is going through these things. As he's certainly he's prayerful. He's he's listening for the Lord, and the Lord speaks to him and reaffirms the next steps for Paul. Take courage, he says, and I think it's important that you understand. He needed to tell him to take courage because he didn't have any left. It was all gone. There, there's, this is it. We're done, right? The, the boat has sailed. We're, the fat lady has sung. We're done. But God tells him, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And I hope you can see how this will rekindle Paul's hope. Cool, I don't die here. That's good news, right? I'm not sure how I'm going to get out of this, but I don't die here. This isn't the end for me. Once again, God has shown him the beginning point, a point A. That's where he's at that night as he says, take courage, and he shows him an ending point, point B. You will testify about me in Rome. But in all honesty, not a lot of details. No mention of the small army that is going to take him to Governor Felix. No mention of the two years he's going to spend in jail there, waiting for whoever to do whatever and figure out how this is all going to go. There was no mention of this, frankly, life and death boat ride that he's going to take to get to Rome. Just a simple hope-filled promise. Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. I, I need you as God's people to understand he's not picking on you, right? Why didn't God tell me? He doesn't tell anybody, right? You know, the truth is, if he'd have told me where he was going to take me, I'd have bolted. I'd have got on the ship to Tarshish with, with what's his name, right? I'm not doing this. You, That's crazy. I'm not doing this. He doesn't tell us about the path between A and B. He simply says, here you are today, there you will be tomorrow. And this is what's happened in Paul's life. And, and again, we flip the page, but you have to understand, two years have passed, right? He's been in jail a couple of years. Paul has appealed now to Caesar. And if I was Paul and I got this word, you're going to go to Rome, it's like, ah, where am I going to get the money to go to Rome? I don't know how that's all going to work. I mean, it costs a lot of money to go to Rome. Guess what? God worked out an all-expenses-paid trip <laughs> on a luxury cruise liner. Okay, it probably wasn't luxury or a cruise liner, but God worked out a free trip to Rome for Paul. And when life doesn't go the way I expect, I often refer back to this passage. And that's what I want to share with you today because I think it is insightful for us. Let's turn to Acts 27, verses 9 through 20. I would also point out as you're turning there, this is how the book of Acts will end. It is with this boat ride that the book of Acts will, will reach its conclusion. And that's because at the end of this boat ride, Paul will have reached his point B. He, he, the words about him will be complete. Picking up in verse 9. Now, this is Dr. Luke writing, okay? So Luke, Luke is going with Paul, but Luke is writing everything down. Verse 9, much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement, which, by the way, we're getting ready to come upon, like the High Holy Days begin very, very shortly. So this is the time of year they were traveling. And this is the time of year of hurricanes and the time of year of crazy stuff. 
Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. And so Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to Paul, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, and so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kata, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard, and they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they were run aground on the sandbars of Sardis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm. The next day, they began to throw the cargo overboard, and on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars had appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And if you've hung out with me any time at all, you know this is always where I pause in this story. I have to interject here. As Christians, pay attention to me. As Christians, you don't have the right to give up all hope. I don't care how bad it got. You don't have the right to give up all hope. And I say that because you are a covenant people. You are a people of a covenant promise. And that means that there is always hope. Always. Now, one might have to ask, where's Professor Paul during this whole thing, right? Because this is Luke's writing. He doesn't say where Paul has gone, but clearly Paul has. Paul isn't with him right now. And I want you to understand, see, Paul's a prophet. Paul's an apostle. He operates in all the gifts. And he is right where he's supposed to be in this hour. He's in his prayer closet. See, he has a prophetic word. He had it before they even left. Remember what he said? This, this trip is going to be disastrous. It's going to, it's going to, it'll be disastrous for the ship, for the cargo, and even for the lives on board. He told them that. But look, you, you, they didn't know who Paul was. How can you blame them? They don't know he's a prophet. They don't know he speaks to God. And they said, let's press on anyway. So Paul knows. He knows that his fate is tied to the boat. He knows that going in. And he knows that the boat is very shortly going to be in a lot of trouble, right? It's not even really, I mean, it's not good, but he knows it's going to be in a lot of trouble, right? Because the word he got from the Lord, the boat's going to be destroyed. It, it's not going to make it. The cargo isn't going. Well, they threw that over. And they threw the tackle over, right? It's gotten so bad not only are we not going to get paid because we didn't bring the cargo, but we're not even interested. We want, the we want the boat as light as it can be, and that means we're throwing the fishing gear overboard. I'm not sure what we're going to eat, but, but we're going to live. And so here's the thing. Paul has a word. Paul knows that he makes it to Rome. He knows that. What he doesn't know is about everybody else. He doesn't have any word about them. And so Paul draws away to pray. He wants, I believe, to tie his promise to Rome, to make it to Rome. He wants to tie that to the other men on board. And, and this is just, it's really vivid to me. When I was very young uh, in the Lord, he had given me a promise. It's a, it's a personal covenant promise that he gave me. 
right? I can't give it to any of you because he gave it to me. If you got faith, you could receive it, but he told me I would live to see my children's children. Oh, praise the Lord. That's really cool. Yeah, I know. Chris is going, it's like, well, we're halfway there. But I have to tell you, because I believe that promise is yet to be fulfilled in my life, sometimes I'm just a little overbold. I'm not worried about things. And sometimes when things are going sideways in my life, and they do from time to time, I remind myself and the devil, this is what the Lord promised. Some of you have promises. God has said he would do this in your life. It isn't done yet. You need to claim the promise. Some years ago, I was on a, I was on a pretty sketchy plane ride. We were in Mexico, and that probably tells you all you need to know. Um, there were too many people on the plane, and I'm sure the plane was licensed somewhere. That's about all I can tell you. Um, and, and we're flying through a storm, and... I mean, this baby is up and down and up and down and up and down. And, and you know, it just wasn't good. And there was a, a slightly older lady, maybe 10 years older than me, sitting next to me. And she was in a flat panic. And, and I mean, it's just like the plane just dropped a whole bunch of feet in an instant. And everybody gasped. And she just grabbed my hand. And I smiled at her, and she, I mean, you could see the terror in her eyes. And I leaned over to her, and I said, don't worry. This is the safest place you could be in the whole world right now. And I meant it. And the reason I meant it is because I have a promise from God. He told me I would live to see my children's children. Now, I'm not going to explain all that to her, because that's not helpful for her. But she could see the confidence in my eyes. She began to relax. Uh, I didn't get my hand back till we were safely on the ground, but, but that's okay. See, what had happened is in the midst of this storm, she'd lost her hope. But because of the word of the Lord, I had hope to spare, and I could share with her. See, as believers, we need to learn how to deal with the things the devil is throwing at us. And he does throw a lot of things at us. Paul was on a boat that he knew was destined for disaster. He knew that before he got on it. He knew the fate of the boat better than anybody else on it did. And yet, knowing all of that, this is why I, I think I confuse people. I, I can see what's coming. I don't mean to make you afraid. I just want you to know it's coming. See, Paul knows what's coming. He knows how bad it's going to be. He's not afraid. He's the only one in that whole process who didn't give up all hope. Surround yourself with people who don't give up hope. He knew that his prophecy could be a weapon of warfare. That's what he would later share with his young protege, Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 18 of 1 Timothy, Paul writes, My son, wage a good warfare by the prophecies given you. Here's what's going to happen. NIV says it this way. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. See, we have words, we have promises, we have prophecies. And some of those prophecies haven't come to pass yet. They haven't come to pass yet. They will. The word Paul had that night in the barracks was, you today are in Jerusalem. You are going to Rome. Jerusalem's point A, Rome is point B. You will get there. And that was enough for Paul to know for sure that he was not going to die on that boat. In fact, his future was essentially guaranteed by God. Now, there was no guarantee what happened after that. Once he lands in Rome, and once he 
has his audience with Caesar Nero, there's no promise after that. And the truth is, it wouldn't be long after that before his course was complete. So as the, as the boat is being tossed about by the sea, Paul's praying. But he's probably not praying what you think he's praying for. Right, see, I'd probably be in there going, oh, Lord, you said, you said I wasn't going to make, you said I'm going to make, come on now. So I, be, I believe he was praying for the lives of the other people on the boat. Paul knew the storm was likely an attack of the enemy. And the truth is, that's the most likely scenario. That's probably exactly what it was. The enemy was trying to take him out. Our enemy will oppose everyone who has a call in their life. If you have a call in your life, you can expect opposition. I don't know why that surprises Christians. I, I, it surprises me that you're surprised. <laughs> Certainly Paul was praying for strength and direction. But I think he was crying out for the lives of the other 275 men that were on that boat. Let's pick up. In Acts 27, verse 21, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them. So he's come out of his pear closet. Now he's got his answer. Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Um, I told you so. But now I urge you, keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Paul, do not be afraid. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. All right, so here we are, just like Paul. I can't tell you where we're at in the boat ride, but we are somewhere between Jerusalem and Rome, right? We, we, we're in process. And the, the storm has come up. I know many of you are going through some pretty serious struggles right now. I get it. Being tossed around by hurricane force winds in a sea of circumstances that you can't control. And the natural mind wonders, where is God in all of this? But just like Paul, you have, to, you have to take stock of your situation. Stand back and look at it. You too are at a critical juncture in your life and ministry. You're in that hard, crazy place between point A and point B. It's important right now for you in your life, me in my life. Okay, so, so in my life, I have to not give up hope. But I lead a family. I have to not give up hope for them. And I lead a church, and I have to not give up hope for them, right? You each in your own life have to reach a spot where you don't give up hope. I don't care what the doctor said. He, he's practicing. You get that, right? I don't care what the banker said. He's probably not being honest. I don't know what the lawyer said, but he's probably not being honest either. Let's just ask Jesus what his take is on the whole thing. In this process, there is a time for busy work. There is a time to throw the tackle overboard and lighten the boat. There's time to drop anchor. But there's also a time when you have to drop to your knee and find your prayer closet. Just be still and know he's God. I, I want you to recognize that in all battles, right? Uh, boxing matches are classic examples, but you'll see it in all of them. We box for a round and then the bell rings. And there's a, a minute or a minute of rest. When that bell rings, take your rest. Take the rest. You don't need to be busy doing a whole bunch of crazy things. When, when there is a break in the battle, you don't need to keep fighting your enemy. 
Start focusing on God. What has God said? Far too often during these respites that will come to us during the battle, we're still busy trying to attack. Well, that doesn't work like that, right? You're in this, you're in this spot. When the rest comes, take it. This is the time to call on God. It's the time to re, recite to him the promises that he's made in your life. He's given each of you promises. And do you understand when you, when you speak God's promises back to him, you're just letting him know you believe? I believe what you said. I just believe you. I don't even have to do crazy things. I'm just speaking back what you said. This picture on the back wall, often people don't understand it. Soldier all by himself. I fell to the ground. My enemy smiled. Well, the mistake the enemy's making is he thinks I'm giving up. I'm not. I'm praying. And when I say amen, everything shifts. Because I'm going to get back up in the power of God. See, when I say amen, I get up in a renewed strength. Paul got up in a renewed strength. And he shared the word with those around him, and they now had a renewed strength. I'm not walking in my strength anymore. I'm walking in his. I fight the good fight, not based on my understanding of the situation. The truth is, I have no idea what's going on. I fight the good fight based on the word he gave me, the prophetic word he gave me. He told me, and I believe it. I feel a need to remind you, he didn't bring you here to watch you die. He didn't bring you to this battlefield so, so he could watch you be planted in the ground. He brought you here so that you could lay hold of the very thing for which Christ Jesus laid hold of you. He brought you here to be a victor. He brought you here to take the plunder. The, the road between points A and point B, they're never, they're just complicated the point between the announcement and the visually seeing the promise. And on the back side of the promise, whoo, man, God's great. In the middle of the promise, God, where are you? This is just human nature. But those who know their God, come on, those who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. While everybody else isn't, while everybody else is freaking out, while everybody else is going, oh no. See, Paul had a promise. He knew where he was going. Guys, and understand this. Along the way from the, the prophecy he s received that night in that barracks till the time he got to Rome, he would heal the sick. He would raise the dead. He would change the course of lives of many. He would pen a portion of the New Testament. I got to tell you, not a bad run. But we have a tendency to leave those middle parts out. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, he just touches on a few of those middle parts that we don't, you know, we think of Paul. It's like, ah, oh, you go, man. He just, everything was good for Paul. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's the scourging Jesus received, right? Pardon me, what did I say to Yes. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Thank you. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Holy cats. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, and I spent a night and day on the open sea. It appears Christianity just isn't for the faint of heart. Now I'm out of time again. Let me just wind up the story. Acts chapter 28, verse 3. So Paul's, Paul's boat, <laughs> what's left of it, right? Planks of Paul's boat is, are going to arrive on an island of Malta. People will be on those planks. Those who swim could swim. Who could swim did swim. Those who couldn't just rode bits of the boat on in. And in this way, all of his companions survived according to the word the Lord had given him. 
And so they find themselves, they're on this island. And it's, a, it's an amazing victory to me. No one died. And then in 28, verse 3, And Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. I mean, come on, are you serious now? We just got through all of that? And it's a viper? Okay, Christian, the devil doesn't play fair. Newsflash. He's never going to play fair, and you shouldn't expect him to play fair. But I want you to notice that Paul didn't waste a lot of time. Because where Paul going? He's going to Rome. He knows he's going to Rome. Verse 5, but Paul shook the snake off in the fire and suffered no ill effects. Guys, sometimes you just have to shake it off. It's just that simple. You just have to shake it off. I know it's painful. I know you're hurt. I know it's hard. Shake it off. It is an interruption in a process. It is not the end of the process. Right? When the bank calls and says, hey, all your money's, uh, we don't know what happened. It's been misplaced. Yikes. Okay, it's just an interruption. When the doctor calls and says, hey, um, we're going to need you to come in for more tests. Okay, fine, but it's an interruption. He suffered no ill effects. Guys, sometimes you just need to take a knee and you need to regroup. You need to remember the promises that you have. I need you to recognize certain things are sealed. Certain things in your life, they're sealed. They, and by that I mean they can't be changed. They can't be adjusted. Certain things in your enemy's life are sealed. Whatever situation you are facing today, whatever challenge you're facing today, this is not how it ends for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm not being esoteric. The crown of life and eternal dwellings await you. There is nothing the enemy can take from you. Nothing. To those who overcome, great reward lies ahead. The situation the devil finds himself in today, however, this is the best it's ever going to be for him. He is he's living the high life today. This is it. Because it isn't how it ends for him either. What awaits him is eternal damnation. Simply put, you win and he loses, and that cannot be changed. You may have to walk through some ugly stuff, but it's for a short time. What he has to walk through later, that's a long time. Guys, even if he plays the most powerful card he has, if he plays the death card, that's it, that's the big gun, that's the biggest one he's got. The truth is, it still isn't final, right? It's temporary. I hope, I hope you get that. It's temporary. It means your address is about to change. Remember Billy Graham, right, at the end of his life, he said, he said one day you're going to read that Billy Graham has died. He said, don't you believe a word of it. Don't you believe a word of it. I am not dead. You just need to understand, your enemy is dead where he stands, and you cannot be killed. Just trying to bring a little perspective this morning. So whatever it is you're facing, take a knee. Begin to recall the promises that he's given you. Right? And if, he hasn't, if you have no promise, then it's time to get before him and get a promise. But I'll be honest with you, most of you, I know you well enough to know you already have promises. He's already given you words. You need to recognize your fate and the fate of your enemy. And then just say amen. Shake him off. Jesus, help us today. Father, help us to recognize the storm that we're in and the storm that lies ahead. And Father, recognize that you walk with us every step of the way. Father, help us to see the perspective that we are the victors. That there is nothing that can be taken from us. Everything we have is hidden in you. 
Everything we have is with you. Father, I pray for my friends here today. I pray for those who are facing terrible challenges. And Father, I speak your word over them. They're more than overcomers. More than overcomers. Father, I bless this people in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, you would encourage their hearts today as you encouraged Paul's heart that night on the boat. Bless them now in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And when the supper had ended, he took the cup. And again he gave thanks and gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This is the cup of my blood, which will be shed for you, so that your sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Lord, you are worthy of our best. You are worthy of our lives, of everything that we have to give. Uh, You are worthy of it all. Help us to keep that sensibility. Help us to keep that mindset, to understand that, Lord, and treat you as the great and powerful and glorious King that you are and how you deserve. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Jesus would tell the disciples, he said, we're going to go to the other side of the lake. They all get in the boat, and he takes a nap, and a storm comes up. Don't you even care that we're all going to die? We've all felt that way, haven't we? It's like, God, seriously, you're napping, now's when you choose to nap? Guys, you need to stay with the boat. Out of all the places you could have been on the face of the earth that particular day, on the boat with Jesus, that was the safest place you could be. There was not a single chance that boat was going down that night. He's so convinced he just was taking a nap. Stay with the boat. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to to paint some parallel, but I will tell you that Jesus is here. Jesus does rest in our midst. Stay with the boat. And whatever comes, whatever happens, He will take us through, I promise. He will take us through. Father, I bless your people today in Jesus' name. I'm so thankful for them. Father, for those who should be here and aren't, Lord, I I pray, Father, you'd extend your grace to them. I pray, Father, that you would restore them and bring them back. Father, I'm asking for the the prodigals. And Father, for those who have maintained, Father, I pray that you would bless them. I pray, Lord, you'd make them the head and not the tail. I pray, Father, you would defend them according to your righteousness and by your great name. I pray, Father, that you would push back the evil one in their midst. I pray, Father, that the plans of the enemy would be canceled in Jesus' name. And that we would complete the work you've given us. Father, I pray that you'd cause your face to shine on them. I pray, Lord, your favor would go before them. And people would be predisposed to do them good. I pray, Lord, that your protection would be on them. I call for the blood of Jesus to be on them. I pray, Lord, that you would make their mouths a gospel horn. And that they would be effective in the sharing of their faith. And Father, I pray the signs and wonders spoken of by your word that they would follow them according to the word, for we are believers. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.